Hello and assalamu alaikum, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. This marks the first episode of the Carlton Pakistani Student Association podcast, Baat Cheat. My name is Mikhail. I'm the marketing manager for the PSA. We launched this podcast as a way to share stories and perspectives from the South Asian community here at Carlton and further at other Ontario universities as well. We're going to discuss careers, philosophies, traditions, cultural upbringing, and lifestyle choices from people who are either current undergrad students, graduate students, former students, and faculty and staff members of an Ontario university who identify as being of South Asian origin. To me, South Asian uh, used to just mean India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and the majority of our guests do fall into those categories. However, the official term extends to people originating in Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Bhutan as well. And we'd like to use this podcast to explore our cultural similarities and open the floor to amicable discussions to people who identify as South Asian. So we plan to release podcasts every week on Friday, at least for this first season. Episodes are going to be released on Spotify and YouTube. You can follow our channels uh, on Instagram and Discord, and you'll you'll be able to see the releases of the episodes there. So keep an eye out for that. On our very first episode, uh, we're joined by Ms. Usma Gilani. Uh, she is a Carleton alumnus who works for the Charity Insights Canada Project, the CICP. This organization collects data on registered charities in Canada. She is also a consultant at the Asian Development Bank. She completed her master's in philanthropy and nonprofit leadership from the University of Liverpool, as well as her uh, bachelor's in global HR from the University of Liverpool. She's Pakistani by origin, having moved to Canada in 2014. So thank you so much for joining us. Ms. Uzma, I'm really excited to, to have you as our first guest. So am I excited to be here. Thank you. All right, that's great. Yes, maybe we can just go into a, a bit of background. Where are you from in Pakistan? Uh, how did you end up moving? What was your education like back there? Okay, so I'm from Lahore in Pakistan, and I ended up moving to Canada as an immigrant. Um, I moved away from Pakistan a long time ago, and I was in the Middle East for a long time. And then at some point, you know, my husband and I decided to immigrate to Canada. And um, I moved to Quebec in the beginning. That was 2014. I was there for several years. That was my entry into Canada. Um, lived in a in the West Island of Montreal, which is like a, it's a it's an English speaking almost. Anglophone area of the Montreal region, so maybe less intimidating for people who don't speak French. I was okay because I do, yeah. and um, I did. I loved it there. And at the moment, I live in the in the Greater Toronto area. I just moved here a year ago, and in between, I wasn't in Canada for a few years. That's amazing. You you also uh, did some work and some studying at Carleton, was it? So I did my masters at Carleton because um, when I arrived in Canada, I was coming from several years of doing nothing. Because uh, when I lived in the Middle East, there weren't many opportunities for work and I had young children. So I thought, okay, this is a great time to study. And that's when I did my my master's in, in global HR from the University of Liverpool. It was remote. And um, when I moved out here, I thought I'd make up for a lot of lost time and started volunteering immediately with community organizations that I was interested in. And then that led to employment opportunities at a community council. And it, it went on from there. And then I decided I needed to, I felt like I needed to validate myself a bit um, and get a Canadian degree and relearn some things in, in a Canadian context. And that led me to taking up the master's in uh, philanthropy and nonprofit leadership at Carleton. The master's was actually partly remote. We only needed to be on campus for a summer institute, which is two weeks long. And then we had some seminar courses. So we weren't always there. It was, I, I was in Ottawa maybe three times okay. uh, during the entire time, three or four, I don't remember. Okay. So yeah, little bursts of time and the rest of okay. it was remote. Okay. And um, <clears throat> what was your experience like studying uh, in Carleton? Uh, and how would you say, did it prepare you for the work you went, to, went on to participate in? Okay. Well, when I started my program, I had no idea I'd move away from Canada. So I had been preparing myself for the Canadian workplace <laughs> and mm -hmm. ended, ended up moving away. So that was a bit of a struggle for me, the, the, mm -hmm. the few years that I wasn't here, because yeah. obviously living on a different continent, trying to connect back to issues back here was a little bit hard, but obviously um, it, it was a big, it's a big plus now that I'm back and I'm reconnected to all the things that I was interested in or involved in before I left. So uh, definitely having a Canadian degree does help. Uh, that feel like a, that's a good thing for, for our students to hear at least. Uh, oh yeah, it does. <laughs> and how, how was it that you were able to connect with those issues? Cause you had to be very much connected with 
uh, things that were going on here? How did you do that from a distance? Um, I actually didn't a lot because um, initially when I moved away, I was halfway through my program. So what helped was that for the next one year, I was doing courses um, at Carleton and I was talking to, you know, everybody who was here and that helped. So I was sort of connected to what was going on, but then okay. it, I couldn't keep up because I was like a, what, a 12 to 13 hour time difference. So right. you feel like you're in a different world and right. it's very hard to say, okay, well, this is happening in Canada because I really couldn't yeah. keep up with it. And yeah. I was also trying at the same time to find opportunities where I was. Um, right. And that's what led to, to my employment at the Asian Development Bank headquarters. Mm -hmm. I work as a communications consultant there. And um, yeah, that's how I ended up finding that. And I'm still doing that. Um, I work remotely <laughs> from here. Yeah. So, so, so let's talk about that. What is the development bank? I know only a little bit about it, but uh, where is it based and what are their kind of initiatives, their goals? Okay. Well, the Asian development bank has headquarters in Manila in the Philippines okay. and they have, I don't know how many, but they have several country offices, uh, all over Asia. So the presence is from somewhere in, you know, um, what Georgia till whatever, Malaysia, Indonesia, um, everything in between. Pakistan right. as well has an ADB office mm -hmm. in Islamabad. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge organization. The headquarters in Manila is about, what, 1,500 people. So it's huge. And they work towards the development in Asian development countries, in infrastructure, investments, and yeah, yeah <laughs> development in, um, in South East Asia and in Asian countries. Yeah. Okay. And I'm sure like that's such a big market in, in Asia, especially in South Asia. It is. It's huge. And so there's, you know, there's so much to it. There's, they have the, um, uh, the infrastructure development and they have financing, they have women empowerment. There's so much going on over there. So it's a huge, uh, huge organization and um, finding an opportunity there is sort of hard because it's, first of all, it's very competitive. Second of yeah. all, there's a huge focus on uh, skills and um, experience. Mm -hmm. So I found that to be hard for myself, right. you know, given my background, I hadn't worked for very long. My experiences right. were a bit more in the nonprofit sector in Canada. Mm -hmm. So, but I did have, I did have communications experience. I've, you know, worked in journalism in Pakistan. I have good writing skills. So I think I found, you know, I applied for a few things and I eventually found something and I've stuck with that. It's, I work with the same department. Uh, it's been three years now. That's, that's great. Yeah. And that's, um, it's interesting to, to hear how those, how those things work out, right? It's so uh, intimidating at first. Uh, and then you, you end up realizing that you do actually have experience and, and even soft skills and even hard skills from, yeah. from your various uh, yeah. things you're involved in. It just in. depends on how you, how you can, uh, spin it really like, you know, okay. basically. I feel like that's what I'm doing all the time. Cause I'm always having okay. to have moved around a lot because of my husband's right. work. So I feel like I'm always kind of trying to find a spin on uh, things I can do um, right. based on where I am. That's interesting. Yeah, because I, I feel like Canadian, uh, you know, people who are in Canada, they study Canadian, they're very much in the system, right? And it's very standardized. And mm -hmm. uh, people who have to come from, from different backgrounds, they have to put that spin and try and fit that standard template almost. Yep. It's um, really hard. I can tell you because when I initially, initially came here in 2014 and I was um, volunteering and working with um, different community organizations. And I remember volunteering for this particular one where I went on later on to work. And after I'd done my volunteering with them, I remember the director, you know, talking to me and encouraging me to apply for a full-time position. And um, at that time I was fairly new here. So I didn't really know mm -hmm. there was a provincial program for new immigrants to integrate them into the workplace. Yeah. And so she, you know, she asked me to apply through that. And she mm -hmm. said, well, you know, I'm just afraid that somebody who looks at your CV, for example, will not see mm -hmm. the potential because they're just going to look at the, you know, the sequence of events and see these big gaps and they won't see that potential and you might not get it. Like yeah. I'm afraid of that, but then I, I did end up getting it. I was lucky, I guess. And yeah. so I started working for her. It was under a, under a provincial program. So they Actually, they paid my salary because I was working for a small nonprofit and she essentially couldn't afford to hire somebody. So it was great. It was my first job in Canada. Lots of uh, exposure, lots of learning. Yeah. And I'd like to come, come back to this, a lot of management and institutional development throughout, throughout your career, at least as far yeah. as I'm seeing. And what would you say? So you've been obviously in different positions, uh, but occupied kind of that same uh, role in those, not mm -hmm. same, but you know, similar. Um, 
Would you say there's any universal qualities, aspects uh, of each work that you've picked up that are kind of, that run through all of them, sort of at a higher level? I, I don't know, but I think um, one of them would be communication, because that's always been, that's kind of like the thread that runs through everything, because I'm really, I'm really, I've always been good at that. So I think that that applies towards, for example, if I'm working at a nonprofit, it's, uh, you know, when I'm writing reports or doing an analysis, that helps, right? So it, I can apply it there. I don't have to be a communications role, but I can be, you know, I can do the analysis. So that's how I got my job, because I could do an analysis. Uh, I could analyze some, some data that they had and I made a report. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, you shouldn't think really too much in the box, especially when you're coming with a very diverse skill set or you don't have the exact experiences somebody's looking for. There's always a way if you have skills, there's always a way to, to put a spin on them and, um, Uh use them somewhere, fit yourself in. It's not easy. Not, I'm not saying that it's easy, not to minimize it, but I'm just saying that you can try. It, it is possible. Oh, for sure. I'm in, uh, I'm doing a, an internship as well in my program. And uh, a lot of, a, a big thing that they teach you is, yeah, how can you reframe your, your yeah. experience? Because it's not going to Absolutely. be that. It's not going to be a problem. No. Right. So no, it, it will not. And especially yeah. for internationally trained individuals, yeah. especially, you know, the ones yeah. who are coming in here at the postgraduate yeah. level or immigrating here at an, at a later stage in life, uh, they're not coming with skills that are applicable, uh, directly applicable. So you have to, and then, you know, you come to Canada and you're encouraged to volunteer. Um, mm-hmm. and it's really funny because I took a, I took a language refresher class when I lived in Quebec and one of the women said, you know, she was, I don't know, from some Arab country, I don't remember which. And mm-hmm. she said, well, you know, everybody tells me to volunteer, but what is volunteering? <laughs> for sure. Uh, and I really like that you brought that up for, yeah. for diverse individuals, uh, bringing in yep. those skills that don't necessarily match the same format. I would like to talk about how yeah. South Asian heritage especially influences us in our in our careers uh, maybe i can get to that a little bit later yeah i'd just like to talk about uh, your masters in philanthropy and nonprofit mm-hmm. leadership because that's that's very fascinating to me what is what would you say is involved in the study of such a subject such a practical hands on subject uh, well you know philanthropy if you look at the the definition of philanthropy you'll see that it's it's the desire to promote the welfare of a society or a population uh, especially through you know, fundraising, raising money and uh, trying to improve their situations in whichever way that you can. But then, you know, for me, it's a bit broader than that. It's not only about fundraising because uh, the MPNL program actually has a pretty strong focus on fundraising. It's actually an excellent program for people who are in the profession and want to improve their skills or are interested in pursuing um, those kind of roles. But for me, it had a much broader meaning. Um, I think that giving is not just giving of money. Uh, it's also your time, your skills. Um, and what makes it more meaningful uh, is to give to things that you are passionate about. Because mm-hmm. then the impact is twofold. Because not right. only do you improve, you know, maybe not only do you make an impact in somebody else's life, but you're also, you know, improving yourself. You're feeling better about yourself. So it, there's a, mm-hmm. I guess, a bit of self-actualization there. Um, yeah. So that's, for me, that is what it was. Because when I applied, I've always volunteered. I mean, even in Pakistan, which was, I guess, not very traditional back in the time when I was younger. And I used to have, I spent some time in Islamabad a couple of years, and there used to be a home for physically and mentally disabled children called umid noor It was somewhere in the F, F sectors. I don't know if it still exists or not, but it was a small little place. And I had, you know, two of my friends, we and I, we used to go over there um, every weekend. And just to give a break to the people that work there and just play with the kids. And it was immensely hard in the beginning because being as a, being around mentally disabled children is actually pretty difficult if you're not used to it because you don't know how to behave or to act and some of them tended to be very affectionate they want to hug you and i'm i'm not a hugger uh, yeah. <laughs> per se so for me that was like a especially difficult but i think that just being there I, I learned some pretty painful lessons about inequalities and prejudice in our society yeah. Because there were children there who were who had been rejected by their families and um, left at this place because they were abnormal. I mean, or considered abnormal. There was one child that had been thrown off a rooftop because she was she was a girl and her family didn't want her. So uh, she ended up with a lifelong physical and mental disability. So there were things like that. It just I think it had a very deep impact on me. And um, I've always 
liked to to help or to do right. things that can you know bring something to someone somewhere mm -hmm. i used to or i used to volunteer at the, the orphanage as well in islamabad mm -hmm. just go in sometimes um do an english lesson mm -hmm. and that's how i actually i i couldn't get to do that when i lived in the middle east but as soon as i got here uh, one of the first volunteering opportunities i had was at the south asian women's center in in montreal Right. And I used to teach an English class once a week to immigrant women. Right. And I mean, I'm not an English teacher by profession. It's, you know, it's not something I've ever done, but it's something I love so much because right. it brings me a lot of joy. And I feel like I'm bringing my skills and my talent or my education to help somebody else. And these are, and I have the privilege of a lot of education and exposure through, you know, through travel, through whatever lifestyle. So for me, maybe life was not as intimidating in many ways as it is to somebody who's coming to the, a Western country for the first time in their lives, have right. never spoken a word of English, right. don't know what to do. So, I mean, it brings me a lot of joy. It's one of my favorite yeah. ways to volunteer. I love right. working with uh, new immigrants. Right. That's great. And it sounds like, at least in Pakistan, it sounds like proact being proactive was very important. Uh, you just went, you know, you walked in and, uh, and you asked. Yeah, I just, like, yeah, that's me. That's, just, that's, I just that's, get that's, up and go like when I can I mean I always I can't always but when I can yeah. I'll just get up and just do whatever yeah. I feel like doing because uh, yeah. I, I enjoy doing it and you'd recommend that to people who want to do the same thing. I absolutely, absolutely recommend it I yeah. feel like there isn't enough of it because you mm -hmm. know you get a lot of a uh, lot of reminders here when you're living mm -hmm. in Canada you, you're reminded to volunteer here or give your time there or give your money exactly. there or whatever yeah. but in Pakistan I think it's even more important uh, to do yeah. that and our societies is is made up in a way that there's I think a million opportunities to give um, sure. of your time and your energy and your talent to someone. And I still try to do that. I'm, I'm, I even volunteered with a kind of small nonprofit, I'm actually forgetting their name, but they work with um, a high school in Chakwal. So they do, they do English lessons and mentoring for these girls who don't know anything beyond that, you know, place. And I, so I did that for a few months with them and I'm actually meeting with them tomorrow to work on the syllabus. Uh, yeah, I love doing that. I feel like yeah you know, that's, um, it's a small thing, but I think it has a pretty big impact on somebody's life. Yeah, that, that's, uh, it's interesting. That's come up in, in a lot of my discussions, actually, that I've had is that is the passion attracts the work. The work doesn't attract mm -hmm. the passion necessarily. It's Absolutely. Passion yeah. Will bring people will bring you opportunities. Itself. Absolutely. And that's why I said, if you know, when you're giving, whether it's money or talent or time or energy, it ha it should be to something that you're passionate about, because mm -hmm. then you'll see the impact will be so much bigger in every way, not just to your, you know, to the others, but to yourself as well. That's, uh, that's really incredible. So for a little bit, I would like to touch on our South Asian heritage, for instance, uh, you know, the, the influences that come in from that into our work life, our personal life, has mm -hmm. your specific heritage from Pakistan, from Lahore, has it influenced your decisions uh, in terms of your career and, and the way you work? Do you see it manifesting uh, in your behavior at, at times? I don't really know how to answer that question. I'm, I was, you know, thinking about it. <laughs> I'm thinking, does it have an effect? Because see, I didn't come here directly from Pakistan. So I think right. some of those right. things got diluted along the way. I was mm -hmm. somewhere else for 10 years mm -hmm. and um, getting back to the flow of things once I was here. And and let me think now did my culture affect the way that I work uh, maybe sometimes I felt mm -hmm. that the ethic might be different or I might be I feel that as South Asians because we're used to a certain way of working especially if you've worked in Pakistan that you yeah. work you know yourself to the bone you're like so intense about everything that you do because that's demanded of you Mm -hmm. but it's not the same here. So I feel like maybe sometimes I had the tendency to just overdo stuff yeah. <laughs> because yeah. that's just the way I was trained to do it or yeah. just be, just take it all too seriously. Maybe, I don't know. I think it's just a cultural thing. And that's probably the way I approached my academics as well. Like nobody forced me or had a, you know, hold a gun to my head, but I needed to get those A's like, yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I have to that's... prove it. Even, just, even if it's just to myself, like I have to do it. It just cannot be less than that. So... And I think, yeah, a lot of people can identify with that <laughs> because uh, the family culture, whether they don't want to follow it themselves, the family kind of brings it along with them, especially if they immigrate. And so parents, yeah, I guess. Like, 
you're, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, well, nobody was telling me I'm too old for that, but but still, it's just something like I had to do it. I had to prove it to myself yeah. that I am, if I'm working at school, then I'd have to get all my A's, or if I'm doing right. this, it has to be the best. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so it was very much ingrained. Um, and I can Somewhere. identify with that because even in my internship right now, I find, I find those tendencies coming up actually as, okay, yeah. I need to just work and work and work. And it's like, People, you know, my supervisor, everyone tells yeah, me, yeah, yeah. step back. Uh, what do you think? Take it easy. Like, okay, let's I know. Yeah, yeah. I don't, and I don't know how to do that. It's such a mismatch there. It's like, what do you need me to do? What are the tasks? And I'll drift it down, like, you know, things like yeah. that. Yeah. And also, I think one thing that I found a little bit different um, was when I was working, I think it was one of my earlier places of work. I don't remember exactly when or what, but because, you know, in our culture, you treat or speak to people who are older than you pretty differently. Um, yeah. There's that, you know, that element of respect and just, yeah. not just respect, but you know what I mean? Like, it's not, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it, you draw this you're, class you're, difference almost. You mm -hmm. have, yeah, somewhat like that. So I felt like, you know, I didn't really see that because we had somebody much older than us working with us. And some of the interactions with another one of my colleagues were, you know, kind of, um, I found them to be pretty, uh, from my standpoint, they felt a bit rude almost yeah. or insensitive not rude right. not rude she wasn't rude but kind of insensitive and for me it was like no but you know she's older than us so we should be kind of treating her this way so mm -hmm. that's one thing that I felt but that's not a big deal it's just a small little thing that I kind of picked up on of course and it's interesting you said they're so deeply embedded uh yeah. like no one was telling you to do this and no one was no uh, that's was that's just... how you we how that's how we are raised so that's you right, know yeah yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that, that that doesn't really leave us, does it? Um, yeah. uh, I would like to just change topics just for a little bit before we wrap up part one. Uh, you've lived in quite a few cities in Canada. So you've lived in, mm -hmm. in Montreal and then yep. big city, uh, uh, now in the GTA. Uh, where specifically? Yes, uh, I'm in Oakville and okay. I lived in Calgary as well. So I've, I've probably lived in more of Canada than many Canadians. Uh, I would say <laughs> that as well. Yeah, East absolutely. West Coast. <laughs> so. and that's that's very interesting yeah i was going to say like i've found quite a few parallels between the the cities here and the cities i don't know i i feel like i can do this as a pakistani i don't know i'm sure yeah. indians can do it as well i don't know if, if other south asians can but uh i always end up comparing toronto and lahore and i end up comparing islamabad and ottawa i'm i'm from islamabad and yeah. uh, there's just these there's so many different similarities and i feel like people end up gravitating towards Towards the Lahores and the Karachis, right? Very yeah. much so, yes. And I feel like, yeah, in Karachi, I mean, they want to go back to Karachi. They miss it so much, but they, uh, yeah, I feel like Toronto is a very big attraction for them. So does that seem at all, uh, is it your perspective as well? No, feel that, not, absolute, not absolutely my perspective because I did end up moving to Montreal as my first place yeah. of residence. So I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't motivated by the South Asian community. Right presence yeah. um although you know thinking back i would say maybe i should have moved somewhere where i saw more of people that look like me um because really? yeah. it, it it can be hard like i didn't have negative experiences really but yeah. i you know my city my t city had a population of nineteen thousand people and i probably look was the only person who looked like me i never saw other people like you know uh visible minorities that look like me yeah. uh so i kind of stood out i worked in a community council so i was everywhere so i did stand out and i did take that position kind of very seriously because <laughs> right. i thought okay i'm here representing everybody else but right. anyway um I guess people do gravitate towards these big cities because of the presence of um, other South Asians. And then, you know, there's your food. The food is a big factor, I feel yeah, like. Yeah. Um, and the yeah, just the, pe the presence of other people that look like you. I guess, so. I guess it makes a big difference. Yeah, familiarity but for sure. Familiarity uh, for sure. But I I don't know if it's, you know, that, that much of a great thing. Because now that I've lived in all these different places... I feel like uh, the GTA is super different from anywhere else that I lived in. Mm -hmm. um, when I lived in Montreal, it was the city was probably very multicultural. Where I lived wasn't. I was the only person who looked like me right. um, amongst thousands of people. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I was kind of used to that, more of a very white Canada, moved out to Calgary, which seemed right. way more diverse uh, right. and multicultural. Uh, I saw a lot of other kinds of people, which felt really nice after mm -hmm. being in that mm -hmm. <laughs> stronghold of no visible minorities mm -hmm. so gta was initially when i moved here i was moving from southeast asia felt amazing just to be here 
um, eat all the food, see all mm. of these people that look a lot like me, but I'm not yeah. sure that I like to be just in communities where everybody looks like me because then why am I here? Okay. You know what I mean? Like, it's nice to have the diversity uh, and live in not concentrated pockets of Southeast yeah. uh, South Asia. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's so fascinating that you say that. I, I feel the same way, but I feel like a lot of uh, my friends, at least, and South Asians that I know don't agree with that because they just want to be in their familiar zones. And it's such a yeah. natural feeling, of course, among immigrants. Uh, to, it to feel is. Um, I mean, I don't disagree with that. I feel like it's, it's great. It's really nice. Uh, the only thing that I don't like about that is that then people tend to just stay in that. And mm. now that you're you're here, you adopted this as your country. Um, it's important to get out and be part of things and represent yourself. Show that you are like you know you care, and that and and be involved in uh, whatever's happening around you. Because when you live in little mm. clusters like that, then that's all you do. You're so unaware of anything that goes on around you because all you care about is that little cluster. And then um, people get over mm. overzealous about things that are happening back in Pakistan while there's all kinds of stuff happening all around us that they have no idea about. So you yeah. need to keep a balance between the two. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, that opens up so much is, is kind of this lack of willingness to incorporate yourself in the real, like, yeah. out, outer Canadian society yeah. and mm -hmm. uh, the importance of representing yourself. And I really like to get into that. Uh, yeah. I feel like that's a great topic to get into. And I'd love to talk about that more uh, in our next part, actually. Um, for now, I think this is a really good part one. Thank you, everyone, for uh, for joining us. A really great session. I really enjoyed uh, my discussions. Stay tuned for part two. Uh, we'll be releasing that next week. And take care.